I've always been amused thinking about the Greek mathematicians and philosophers a couple thousand years ago, sitting around a fire and saying to themselves, you know what, let's take two cones and put them tip to tip and then slice those cones in various ways and look at the intersections. Look at kind of what figures we get when we slice them. And those figures would include a circle, a parabola, an ellipse, and two parabolas that face away from each other, a hyperbola. And together, these are your conic sections. So we're gonna work with conic sections in 10.5 and 10.6. Um, in particular, there's a couple things I'd like you to get here. Uh, one of them is, you know, well, which, what conic are you looking at? The conic sections are basically special cases of this equation for different values of A and B. I'm hoping that some of this is just review from your college algebra, but I will go through it carefully but quickly. So the big thing is, you know, what kind of section you're looking at. And you can tell just by looking at this equation here. Now the easy pickings is to decide if it's a parabola. Now if it's a parabola, it's only gonna have one squared term. So if one of these, either A or C is zero, meaning you don't have an X squared or you don't have a Y squared, if you only have one squared term, then you're dealing with a parabola. So is A or C zero? Yes. In that case, you're dealing with a parabola. If not, then you've got some more digging to do. Now with uh, hyperbola, the squared terms are gonna be opposite in sign once they're on the same side of the uh, equation. So, yes? Um, is there a printout that we have or are we just copying this down? Yeah, I, this is something that I emailed to you guys and it's okay. also on desire to learn. If you go to the handouts section, it should be there for section 10.5. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So if A and C have opposite signs, then okay, then you're dealing with a hyperbola. If not, then you gotta dig still a little further. Now the last possibility is if these two coefficients uh, for the A squared, or excuse me, for the X squared and the Y squared, if they're the same, then you're dealing with a circle. And if you keep on saying no to all these, no, 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 then you're dealing with an ellipse. So with that, and I can kind of keep this up here for a minute. Let's see if we can't do a little Kahoot on this to try and get you through this. So let me uh, pause the video here for a second. So we're gonna do our little Kahoot here and see how you guys can do. Um, we already did a little warm up question, so the real one starts next. And let's go. So you only get one guess. You can't change it once you've entered it. <clears throat> the faster you enter, the more points you earn. Eight seconds. Get your answers in. Answer something. All right, 11 for the ellipse. Let's take a look at this one. So it's 9x squared minus 36x plus 4y squared. Well, right away you can eliminate a parabola because you got two squared terms. But the squared terms are both positive. So what does that eliminate? Anyone? That eliminates a hyperbola. If both of these had the same sign, then it'd be, a, uh, excuse me, if they had opposite signs, then it'd be a hyperbola. Because these coefficients are different, they're not both nine or both four, it's not a circle, so by default, we run through everything else, it's an ellipse. All right, let's see how we're doing. 
Okay. Jackson C up front. Well done. Well done. All right, let's try a few more. So the idea is that you answer quickly and accurately. Don't screw up though. If you fat finger it, you can't, you know, input another answer. It's only going to give you one shot. So good luck. Eight seconds. Well done, all right. So only one squared term, That's me. that means a parabola. Uh, hyperbola would have to have two squared terms that are opposite in sign. So let's see if Jackson C held on to his lead. Woo, still up there, but Matthew's close on his heels. Nash in third place, still lots of room on that podium. Let's see who can make it. Shit. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Fat finger. I'll make sure I put the uh, not made for kids box. I'll have to check that when I uh, upload it to YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Is this recorded? You're recording yeah. the Kahoot too? Yeah, yeah, I'm recording the Kahoot. All right, nah, not as much certainty on this one as it was the last one. So again, you've got two squared terms, so that eliminates the parabola. It can't be a parabola. Um, if it was a circle, both of these coefficients would be the same. So it's not a circle. If it was a hyperbola, then these coefficients would have opposite signs. So it's not a hyperbola, it's another ellipse. All right, who's left standing? Jackson, still strutting it up in front. Well done, well done. A um, Couple new faces in our top five and uh, somebody who's using expletives dropped out of the top five. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. All right, I think we got everyone. Three seconds if you haven't answered. Bam. Well done, hyperbola. All right. Nice and easy because these two things have opposite signs. So great. Let's see where we're at. Wow. Jackson still leading, still leading it. Uh, Hunter, Matthew, well, it looks pretty consistent up there in the top five. Two more. All right, so my apologies. For whatever reason, I set the timer here on this 60 seconds, not 30 seconds. So someone tell me a joke that takes 22 seconds. Ready, go. All right. Left parents, that's a joke. <laughs> All right. I'm just kidding. That was, that, was, that was a little too short, though. We still have six seconds. OK. I hope I changed the timer on the last one. Circle, well done. All right, two coefficients. Uh, the square terms have the same coefficient, which is one. They're both positive, so circle. 
Ooh, really close there. Hunter's really close. Matthew's not too far behind. Guys can't make any mistakes on this last one. Dramatic music for the final finish. That's redundant. Oh, well. Somebody didn't answer. Hyperbola, looking good there. So the squared terms have coefficients that have opposite signs. That's a hyperbola. Big reveal. Podium. Mike, yay. Bronze medal, silver medal. Drum roll, please. Hunter, whoa. Ah, uh, switch uh, the button order. Jackson, oh, bummer. The button layout wasn't the same as the other ones. Sorry. I you know, I noticed that too. It. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, well. All right. Well, good job. Good job. Thank you so much. Uh, extra credit for everybody. Extra credit for everybody. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, you know, the importance of identifying the conic section is so you know what you're dealing with. And that's a, a good choice of a question for an exam. It's some easy, easy points, really, I would hope. But uh, they have a lot of applications. And we're going to start by working on the parabola. Uh, but let me just show you some of the, the very myriad of applications of the parabola. Uh, let's see, uh, where's slideshow? Uh, from the beginning, there you go. So there's your conic sections. Um, but places you'll see the shape of a parabola. Uh, we're gonna go over the parabola in detail. So let me just jump to a familiar one here. At least it should be familiar if you're from Michigan. Mackinac Bridge, connecting the upper and lower peninsulas, built in the 50s. Newton used a parabolic shaped mirror for his telescope, radio telescopes. If you were on the moon and you wanted to spark up your hookah, they could spot the flare. They're that sensitive, just amazing. Angry Birds, thinking they used a parabola. A Hubble Space, Space Telescope, and the guy servicing it here is Andrew Feustel. He's an OCC graduate. When we say you can get anywhere from here, we mean it, yay. Um, this one's kind of cool. Use a parabolic shaped mirror to get light into a building along a fiber optic cable. Search lights, parabolic microphones. Uh, this one's my favorite. The Vomit Comet is the way they use to train astronauts. They fly up at a really, really steep level and at the tarp top, they arc in a parabola. And on the way down, you experience weightlessness. Yay! If you have 5,000 bucks, you can do this too. Notice anything funny about this picture? Yes, it has a cat in here. <laughs> Somebody took a cat up there. I find that very amusing. Um, let's get going though with parabolas and talking about them. If you opened up your email from me earlier and you saw uh, a nice handout there talking about the anatomy of a parabola. Let me just review some of the the facts about the parabolas. Um, inside the parabola, there's going to be a special point called a focus. And then on the other side of the parabola from the focus is going to be a special line called the directrix. That's actually the way we define parabolas. So let me show you that. It's something that I'd like you to understand. Uh, is it here? Yes, it's here. I can take my parabola and shift it anywhere. Um, left, right, uh, up or down. And well, let's just make this a nice even number here. How about a two? There we go, two. Um, and I can make it open wide or narrow, you know, whatever I like. So we'll just leave it there at two. But what uh, the definition of a parabola. It's just kind of as follows. 
it's a set of points that are at the same time equidistant from the directrix and the focus. So if you notice these green lines, if I draw a green line from the focus to my parabola or a green line from the parabola to my directrix, that distance is exactly the same for every point on the parabola. Now, the distance actually changes, you know, as I move from one side to the next and move around. But what's always true is that distance of these green lines is the same. Now, later on, when we start working with an ellipse, then instead of this distance being the same, um, one distance is going to be a fixed ratio of another one. It's this, so this distance from the focus to the uh, uh, ellipse is going to be less than the distance from the ellipse to the directrix. Um, and then you have some things like that with the hyperbola. So this is actually the basis for defining all our conic sections. But right now with the parabola, these two distances are the same. Now at home, as you're watching this really amazing, cool little uh, Desmos presentation, I'm sure you're going ooh and ah. If somebody wants to ooh and ah for the camera, that's great. But let's actually work with these things, do a few problems. There's some more properties of an ellipse, or excuse me, a parabola that uh, you should know about. Make sure that the focus is always, always inside of your parabola. It should never be outside. The parabola faces away from the directrix, so you'll never have a parabola opening across the directrix. Um, now, this distance here, the distance from the focus to the parabola, focus to the vertex, or the vertex to the directrix, is a special one. That distance we're going to call P, and P is going to be useful for determining where the focus is or where the directric is, et cetera. Now there's a couple different forms of the equation of a parabola. This one that you saw a lot of in intermediate algebra, same with this one. But in either case, the coefficient of your squared term, a, a is really one divided by four times p, where p is the distance between the focus and the vertex, or the vertex and the directrix. Now, you can do the same kind of thing with parabolas that face sideways. So again, A is going to be 1 over 4P. It's just that this one is going to change the geometry because your parabola is going to face sideways. Now, there's also something that is not really explicitly mentioned here. It's called the focal diameter. We'll talk about that. but. Um, Let's get busy with some examples. These problems are taken right out of your homework. So. All right, so section 10.5. Um, so call this example A. We got x squared equals 8y. Now, if you'd like, we can rewrite that as 1 eighth x squared equals y, which is probably what you'd have to put into your graphing calculator anyways. Now, Desmos would take that. Uh, you'd have to put this into your graphing calculator this way. Now, the coefficient there, is 1 over 4a, so or 1 over 4p. So that is our a. a is 1 eighth, but a equals 1 over 4p. So, okay. So we're going to solve this little linear equation. 
and I can do that by cross multiplying. I get 4p equals 8, so p equals 2. Great. Let's draw ourselves a little graph and start figuring out some other things. This is going to be a parabola that opens fairly wide. Maybe not quite as wide as I've drawn it, but I'm not trying to be exact to scale. I just want to hit the important spots, such as the vertex of this. The vertex of this parabola is going to be zero, zero. Now, where should I be putting? the focus? Should it be up here or down here? Up or down? Up. Up. And in fact, since that distance has to be P, that's going to be the point zero 02. Thank you. Yes, it was up. So that's P equals two. Origin. What's that? Is the parabola crossing the origin or no? Yes, I just, I wasn't terribly accurate as I drew it, but it, yeah, I tried to draw that point there, zero, zero, that's the vertex. Now, two units in the other direction, so down to at y equals negative two is going to be your directrix. So we'll sketch that out here. And I can't say that I'm very consistent as to using a solid line versus a dashed line. I drew a dashed line today. If I was teaching college algebra in the fall, maybe use a solid line. But this is your directrix. Yay. And that's it. So all we're looking to get here is, is try and establish what this thing looks like. Now, had there been a negative involved, it would have opened down. Geometry would have switched a little bit, but it's still the same uh, in the sense that the focus is going to lie inside the parabola and the directress is going to be on the opposite side of it as the parabola is always going to face away from its directrix. Okay. How's example A looking? Doing all right with that one? Yep. Got it. Thank you. Got a couple more to work on. So, oops, don't want to hit that one yet. Let's do another one. Call this one example so, B. Uh, yeah, question. It, so, is the directrix just like y equals negative p? Um, is that what it is? Or like, Kind of confusing how you found that. Well, the directrix is going to be a distance of p away from the vertex. So once you have the vertex of zero, zero, you move the distance of p uh, right here to find the directrix. And that's going to be true even in our next example where the vertex isn't the origin. So I think that might help you out as we look at example B, because we're not going to have vertex at the origin anymore. But it's still just going to be that distance away from the vertex. In fact, this distance between the focus and the vertex is always going to be twice P. So that one right there, twice P. All right, let's take a look at X plus 2. If this example doesn't help out with your question, please ask it some more. Now, I guess for this one, I always like to start by noticing where the vertex is. Now, in the last one, it wasn't shifted. It was just zero and zero. But this one has been shifted. Where do you think this is gonna have a vertex? Let's start by making the squared terms equal to zero. 
what value of x would make this squared term equal to zero? Negative two. Negative two. And for the y value? Positive two. Positive two, beautiful. Now, if you want to determine p with the way I've done it here, then I'd rewrite this a little bit. I would write it as, well, I'll divide both sides by 12, one over 12 times x plus two squared equals um, y minus two. So, one over four p equals one over 12. Or four p equals 12, p equals three. And that's what I wanted. I wanted to figure out p. I needed to figure out what p is in order to graph this thing. So again, Let's draw ourselves some graphs. Mm -hmm. Wish I should have drawn this a little further down. It's okay. Okay, so we've got a vertex at negative two and two. Which way is this parabola gonna open, up or down? Up. Up. Because this coefficient of my square term is greater than zero, it's gonna open up. Yay, thank you. So let's just do it. And zero opens up. All right, so it's gonna open up. Um, I could plot other points and graph it really, really carefully. I'm not terribly interested in that. P equals three, so that's gonna mean one, two, three, kind of almost out of room there for the focus, at least on my graph. So this point is negative two and two. What's the coordinates of this point up above gonna be? Negative two, five. Yes, well done, negative two and five. So let's see if I can't make room for that. Vertex. Okay, so negative two and five is my focus. Vertex is negative two and two. Uh, let's figure out where the directrix is. All right, so we, we got this nice focus here. P equals three. Jackson, what's where's the uh, directrix going to be? At y equals negative one. Well done. So y equals negative one. Again, a distance of three away from the vertex. So y equals negative one. Beautiful. And that's a lot of what we're looking for. Uh, but I'm going to throw in one other little bonus thing here that we're going to need in the next example, and that is, let's take a look at the line that goes through the focus. Uh, so this line right here, that line's called the focal diameter focal diameter.
And the question is, how long is that focal diameter? Well, that's a good question. Well, let's see here. If we're on this horizontal line, then that means y equals five. So whatever the point for x, y equals five. And I could plug in y equals five here and then solve for x. So if you do five minus two is three times 12 is 36. So you end up solving this equation right here, x plus two squared equals 36. Mm, let me do it down here x plus 2 squared equals 36, which means x plus 2 is plus or minus 6, or x equals negative 2 plus or minus 6. So you're going to get either negative 4 or, excuse me, positive 4 or negative 8. 4 or negative 8. Where did you get the 36 from? I put in the 5 here, five minus two is three, three times 12 is 36. So that's where I got the 36 from. So this has to be the positive one, this has to be the negative one, negative eight and five there. So let's find the focal diameter, focal diameter. Well, it's just going to be 4 minus negative 8, which is 12. Now, oddly enough, it's always going to equal 4 times p, 4 times the distance between the focus and the vertex, or the vertex and the directrix. And that's a useful little fact that we're going to take advantage of in the next problem. Before I get there, how are you doing with uh, example B here? We did a little bit more here, and I'm hoping that, that you're okay with that. I was yeah. wondering or where one over four P comes from. So one over four P comes from um, analyzing the general form of these types of equations, and it turns out that uh, this coefficient a is 1 over 4p, and determining p allows us to determine, for instance, this distance right here, p equals 3, distance between your vertex and your directrix. But yeah, the uh, 1 over 4p is always going to be the coefficient of your squared term. Now, some books will push this to the other side, and they'll have, okay, 4p equals this, and that's fine. It's just not the way I do it. I mean, personally, I like to have my y terms solved for. So that means putting this over here. It's, it's up to you. It's a matter of preference. If you want to keep this coefficient here with your linear term, then that's fine. And you have 4p equals 12. Well, we got 4p equals 12 anyways. So we're okay. Uh, so the focal diameter is always going to be 4p, right? Yep, always going to be 4p. Thank you. Yep, you're most welcome. I think that was on um, one of my handouts uh, right here. Uh, the focal diameter is always 4 times p. And they put the absolute value of p there, that's fine. Hmm. So let's use that in the next one. Next one comes right out of your homework. Um, it's a good one. Let me see here. Um, so. Example C. Do we have that page with all the bullet points on it and stuff? 
You know, I did send out. Uh, I don't um, think that's. Our it might. It might not be. I might have to uh, send out a different one as well, in addition to that one. So if it's not, my bad. Um, Yeah, that's not too bad. Not bad. All right. So this is a little bit different parabola. Because it opens sideways, then you're going to have an equation that looks like this. A equals, or excuse me, x equals a times y squared. That's going to be a parabola that opens left or right. And in particular, a greater than 0 means the parabola opens to the right. And so they put a couple points on our parabola, A and B and then C and D. <clears throat> and C and D is out here at x equal 11. But a little bit to the left of that, they tell us that the focal diameter, uh, there you go, the focal diameter is 10. So oh, that's the that's going to be between A and B. Focal diameter equals ten. Now that's really helpful, especially in light of what we just mentioned, and that is that um, <clears throat> the focal diameter is four times p. So ten equals four p. 10 over 4 equals 5 over 2. That's P. Cool. Well, with that, I can determine, um, I can determine A. So, say again? Is X equal 11 or 1? Oh, X out here equals 11. Yeah. So, the, the the last part of the problem is going to be to find the distance between C and D. But before we do that, we need to determine the equation, and that means finding A. Now, A is 1 over 4P, which is 1 over 4 times 5 halves, which is 1 over 10. Cool. That means we've got our equation. X equals 1 over 10 times y squared. And that's going to be part of your answer. This is actually going to be a two-part problem. The first part is to plug in the answer for the equation, which we did. You could also spin this as 10x equals y squared. That's just as acceptable. I think that's probably what it would show the answer as in WebAssign, but I'll accept either one. Most people will probably just stick with that. That's fine. But then the question is to find the difference in these heights between C and D. Okay. Well, here's the thing. If x equals 11, we can figure out the y value here. So let's do that. If x equals 11, then find the y value. So then find the distance between C and D. Uh, 
All right, so let's plug in x equals 11. So that's 110 equals y squared. I get plus or minus the square root of 110 equals y. All right. So that gives me a little something. Do you understand why we have to use the plus or minus? There's two possibilities here. Both of them work. This could be the point 11 and negative square root of 110. This is the point of 11 and positive the square root of 110. Our goal is to find the distance between these things. So what's that distance? Anyone? Two square roots of 110. Perfect. Two square roots of 110. So you can think of it this way if you want to. 110 minus negative square root of 110. I should root 110 minus negative root 110 gives you two square roots of 110. Or in other ways is say, all right, basically twice this distance, which is fine. But that's the second and last part of the answer in this type of problem. So I'm hoping that you get getting more refreshed and comfortable with parabolas. Any other thoughts on, on that? Just a quick FYI, you can graph these things um, on your graphing calculator, even if you've got something in Y squared, what you would first have to do is you have to solve for Y, because um, these always have to be Y equals something. So if I did that, I divide both sides by negative eight and then take the square root. Obviously it's only gonna be defined for negative values of X and or zero. So the cool thing is you can plug this in and that's the top half of your graph. To get the bottom half, you can do negative of the top half, negative of Y1. So I'll show you that kind of real quick here. Uh, you know what? Let me grab another one. This one's set up for something different. Okay, so y equals square root of negative x divided by 8. And then to get y1, or the negative of y1, and it's just, look, you can just type in negative of what you had up there. That's fine, like this, negative x divided by eight, that'll work fine. But if you want a little bit of finesse, you can do this, negative, and then you hit the vars key right there, go over to y vars and press enter twice because you're gonna select y1. And it's gonna take, as this equation, the opposite of that equation. We'll use the same window settings that we have here. Negative eight to zero, scale of one, negative 1.2, 1.2 on the y-axis, and again, a scale of one. So there's the top branch, and then there's the bottom branch. Probably a lot easier to do on Desmos. You won't have to solve for X or Y, and just plug in the equation. Questions on that one? Okay, well, let's take a break.